Sisters and brothers, good morning and welcome to this time of worship here at Covenant Presbyterian Church. I am joined by three incredible human beings who have very special announcements for us. So Adele, if you could begin with us and speak right into that microphone, your announcement. Jesus welcomes us all to this table. Amen. And Laurel, you're next. We are the baptized children of God. Amen. And Levi. Jesus is the light of the world, and he says that you are the light of the world, too. Let's give thanks to God for these wonderful leaders in worship. You're welcome to go back to your families, and you can place that right on the table. Friends, after being away for two weeks, it is really terrific to be back in person with my church family. But I understand that Shanna and Carol did a fabulous job, and I almost threatened to take this Sunday off as well. But the personnel committee was not too pleased with that. But Shanna, uh, Carol, our whole staff and volunteers who pick up church when the pastor goes away, thank you from the bottom of my heart. We have a number of announcements for you. The first is small groups. Small groups in the middle of a pandemic. We're just trying to gauge an interest to see if folks are looking for an additional opportunity beyond our women's groups, men's groups, weekly Bible studies. If you are interested in an eight-week small group session, you are welcome to sign up for that at the Connection Center, or you can sign up electronically through the Thursday update. Right now, we have about 10 people signed up, and we'll be faithful to that. And it might just well be that uh, there are only 15 people interested in small groups, and that's okay because we have a number of activities for all of God's people to nurture their faith here at Covenant. Pastor Shanna. Good morning. Well, fall is upon us. I feel like 2021 has went so much faster than 2020, and we will be starting some new things on September 12th. One of those will be a new members class with Pastor Kevin. It will run on the, 9th, or the 12th, 19th, and 26th of September. So if you are interested in seeing what it might mean to be a member of Covenant and you would like to take this course, you can talk to Pastor Kevin. Yes, and you can sign up at the Connection Center next week. Actually, this week. If you're in the Boise School District... You're going back to school, and next week, if you're in the West Ada School District, you're going back to school. And at Covenant, we really value education. It is God's gift to us. So next Sunday, during worship, we're asking all of the students to bring your backpack. If you're an educator, bring your backpack. And we want to bless those here in worship to remind all of our students and educators that what you do is a very holy experience. So blessing of the backpacks next Sunday. We hope you'll join us in that event. We have been talking about our neighborhood night out for several, several weeks now, and it is coming up this Saturday, August 21st from 5 to 7. There is going to be so much going on. We have a classic car show. We have food trucks, and I believe those are featured today. Happy Camper, that's some yummy Dutch oven, Scotty's Dogs, and Slay the Snow, which is um, shaved ice. We have a live band that will be playing, Geode Cracking. If you don't know what that is, you need to come and find out. It's super cool. And we'll have kids' activities. Many people have asked me, bring a chair. Be ready to sit out on our East Lawn and enjoy everything that will be going on. And I do have several people volunteering, but if you'd like to be a part of that event and help us out, then please contact me. Sounds good. Friends, I see a number of face masks this morning. And when I arrive back into the office on Tuesday, I've heard over and over, is Covenant going to do anything different at this point in the pandemic? Friends, on Tuesday, our session will meet and talk about it. But I have been so grateful to lead a congregation during a pandemic that they never taught us about in seminary. 
about how do we act, how do we behave. And friends, the reality is, is that we have a fairly diverse congregation, and I love that about us, because we have never said that we are a Republican congregation or a Democrat congregation. We have always said that we are a Jesus-centered congregation. So the session has asked all of us to follow the CDC guidelines because we are not epidemiologists and to focus on grace. And here's the really important thing for me right now is that the adults in this room, you've had an opportunity to be vaccinated. Terrific. You can make your own choices. But there is a very important part of our congregation that has not yet had that opportunity. So as we think about whether we're going to cover our face or not, please follow the guidelines. And right now the CDC is asking all of us in a large group setting, thanks be to God, we're in a large group to wear masks. There are no COVID cops around. But I just encourage you, as you think about face masks or not, consider those in our congregation who have not yet had the opportunity to be vaccinated. And keep your eyes on Jesus. Friends, we will get through this pandemic together as long as we keep our eyes on Jesus. Friends, you have come here to experience the grace, the wonder of the Lord our God. So let us begin worship with a moment of prayer. Let us pray. Holy and precious God, we are here on this morning ready to encounter you. Lord, we pray that you would give us the courage to put away our politics, that you would give us the courage to put away our egos, to lift our hearts unto you, and ask that once again you would pour out your Spirit upon us. We pray that you would bless us. pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. One final announcement. Our friend Stacy is not here this morning. He's experiencing the pain of kidney stones. So we said, please stay home. Take care of yourselves. We've been blessed by an incredible music team. And many of you know Nathan Furman's face. He's been here moving his mother uh, into Boise, Lahoma, somewhere around here. Uh, and Nathan was scheduled to sing the offertory for us, so I called him yesterday morning and said, Nathan, can you help me? So we don't have live instrumentals, but we are going to have some incredible music. So as we begin our worship, would you stand with me as we lift our hearts to God, as we sing together our first hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy.
Friends, you may be seated. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, is there anyone holy sitting in this room? We become mindful of the many setbacks, frailty sins of our own life when we honestly look upon the holiness of God's throne. In our sin, God continues to love us. Scripture tells us that if we say that we are without sin, that the only person you're deceiving is yourself. But if we confess our sins, that God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us of all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In a spirit of humility, I invite you to pray the prayer of confession found on the screen behind me. Let us pray. Most merciful God, we confess that we are in bondage to sin cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, according to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Friends, who is in a position to condemn you? Only Christ. And Christ lived for you. Christ died for you. Christ rose in victory for you. And at this very moment, Paul tells us, Christ sits at the right hand of God the Father and prays for you. Friends, will you believe this good news that in Jesus Christ our sins are forgiven and the path to eternal and abundant life lie close at hand? Amen. So friends, what do we do with this incredible gift? God tells us that we love. Anna, will you lead us in our response of him? Let us stand and sing together. So before we head into Kids Church, we want to share a little bit with you about the memory verse we're studying, the Bible point, and then we want to share with you in a song that we know and love. So kids, first of all, look up here. 
We have a new Bible memory buddy. Does anyone know what that animal is? A lion. It is. And that lion's name is Zion. Isn't that cool? Zion. And our Bible point for the next four weeks is God is great. Can you guys say it with me? Everybody say it with me, okay? God is great. And our memory verse will be 1 Chronicles 16 through 8. Give thanks to the Lord and proclaim his greatness. Let the whole world know what he has done. What a great message and a good verse for us to learn. Before we go into Kids Church today, we are going to sing our song, Won't Worry About a Thing, because we don't need to worry about a thing when we have our great God in our corner. So as you are able, we want everyone to stand up and join us in our song. out. Okay, kids, we're going to go to Kids Church. You can go with me and Miss Chrissy this morning.
Good morning. Today's scripture reading is 1 Peter 1, 13 through 21, and you can find it on the overhead screen. Let us pray. Gracious God, give us humble, teachable, and obedient hearts that we may receive what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. Since we do not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth, make us hunger for this heavenly food, that it may nourish us today in the ways of eternal life, through Jesus Christ, the bread of heaven, amen. 1 Peter 1, 13 through 21, from the New Revised Standard Version, a call to holy living. Therefore, prepare your minds for action, Discipline yourselves. Set all your hope on the grace that Jesus Christ will bring to you when he is revealed. Like obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires that you formerly had in ignorance. Instead, he who, as he has called you is holy, be holy yourselves in all of your conduct. For it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. If you invoke as Father, the one who judges all people impartially according to their deeds, live in reverent fear during the time of your exile. You know that you were ransomed from your feudal ways inherited from your ancestors, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without a defect or blemish. He was destined before the foundation of the world but was revealed at the end of the ages for your sake. Through him, you have come to trust in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory, so that your faith and hope are set on God. The word of the Lord. Friends, I have two questions for you this morning. I wish I could look each and every one of you in the eyes and into your heart and ask you, what is it that you are living for? What is it that you are living for? Two weeks ago, Lisa Snodgrass lost her father, Meryl D. Tawney. We prayed for Lisa. When I got back, I sat down with Lisa and her mother, Bonnie, in my office and talked about what the service would look like this past Thursday. Dee and Bonnie had been married 60 years. Thanks be to God, right? And do you know what Bonnie said? It went by so fast. For the older folks in here, isn't it true that the older we get, the faster time goes? And so quickly, this one precious miracle of your life goes flying by. And I want to ask you, taking a time out in your life, what is it that you are living for? Because you've only got a few years to live it. My second question is this. What does it mean to be holy? This is not the answer to some dumb joke like, what did the cheddar cheese say to the Swiss cheese? What does it like to be holy? Or we don't, or sometimes when we think of holiness, we think of Ray Stevens had this song a long time ago. Sister Bertha, who is better than you, holier than thou, and no one likes Sister Bertha, right? When we think about holiness, sometimes we think about those people who sit in the back pew and judge people because their lives are better than yours. What does it mean to be holy? Friends, I ask this question because we opened our worship with the song, Holy, Holy, Holy. It's some of our favorites, right? In the scripture that Janie read from 1 Peter, Peter says, Be holy as the Lord your God is holy. Are you holy? 
See, First Peter is not just making this up either. He's actually quoting Leviticus, where God tells his people, Be holy as I am holy, thus says the Lord. How many of you are holy? Sister Bertha in the back pew today. What does it mean to be holy? You know, we really don't like to talk about this as a society, do we? Society likes to talk about, be you, who are you? Corporate culture likes us to think, buy this product and I will feel better about myself. If you go to a university campus, there's a lot of focus on you, but scripture says, be holy. In fact, I would dare say that many of us, if we were to talk in small groups this morning, we might feel a little uncomfortable about, do we really feel called to live a holy life? Well, what does it mean to be holy? What does it mean to be holy? Does anyone know what holy means in the Bible? Rhea is raising her hand, set apart. I think that's a really good definition. Set apart. God is set apart from the sin of this world, maybe. I remember when I was in seminary, uh, Steve Toole said, the most basic definition of holy is other. So when the cherubim and the seraphim of Isaiah recite the ancient hymn, holy, 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 really what they're meaning is other, other, other. God is so mysterious. God is so divine that we can't even comprehend what God is. God is set apart. God is other. God is holy. And what does God tell his people? God doesn't say, oh, just do your best says be holy as I am holy some of you may be wondering why we have the Ten Commandments again Shanna finished up the Tenth Commandment last week I thought about making the sermon title the Eleventh Commandment be nice to your pastor there are other commandments as well but I thought that today is the home run day of the sermon series See, God says, be holy, and God gives his people rules and regulations to set them apart from other people. The Ten Commandments, the nutshell of how God's people are supposed to live. And hopefully, if you've been here the past few weeks, we haven't laid out a nice, don't kill, don't murder, but using the language of Jesus, kind of reminding us how we can't live up to the Ten Commandments. Remember when Jesus said, you shall not murder? But I say to you, if you have ever been angry at your neighbor, you've already committed this sin. Remember that? I don't know any of you who haven't been angry before, right? Jesus is telling us that as we look at the commandments, we can't live up to them. The life, we can't live up to the holiness that God expects for us. Paul, the terrific missionary of the New Testament, he wrestles with this concept as well. He knows the words of Jesus. He realizes that even on his best day, he can't live up to this holiness that God asks of him. He writes about it. Can write the long, you can read the longer version of this treatise in his letter to the Roman church. But there's a nutshell of where, God, or where Paul takes this conundrum of, I want to do good, I want to be holy, but I realize that I'm a human, I'm a sinner, I can't do it. And he writes about this, which brings us to our second scripture passage. It comes to us from the seventh chapter of Romans. We start at verse 14. Paul writes this. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold into slavery under sin. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. 
Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that it, the law is good. There's ten commandments. They're good. But in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. It's kind of like the alcoholic saying, I am going to stop drinking. I'm going to will it, but I can't do it. Verse 19, for I do not do the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that whenever I want to do what is good, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God in my inmost self, but I see in my members another law at war with the law of my mind, making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Wretched man that I am, who will rescue me from this body of death? Paul, the self-proclaimed apostle of Jesus, the one who in many ways gives us the Christian faith as we understand it today, says even he can't live up to the holiness that is the Ten Commandments, that is all of the law of the Old Testament. Even when he wants to do it, he knows and articulates the human experience that we all have, that I want to do good, but I can't. Who is going to save me from this wretch of a man that I am? Paul articulates the human experience when we finally realize the fundamental truth about ourselves and the world in which we live, my friends. Who's going to save us? Who's going to save us from this terrible debate about face masks today? Who's going to save us from the wretched people that we are? Who is going to save us from the political climate where all people want to do is to say, my party is right and your party is wrong? Who is going to save us from the wretched people that we are? Who is going to save us from our bodies that will decay and find their way to the ground? My friends, who is going to save us from ourselves. Earlier in his ministry, Paul, who was known as Saul at the time, he was really good about following the rules and checking the boxes of his religious checklist. He was a leader of the Pharisees, a finely educated man who knew what it was to live a good and moral life. And he persecuted these followers of Jesus. But one day on a journey to Damascus, through the grace of God, <laughs> scales formed over his eyes and he heard a voice saying, Saul, why are you persecuting my church? And who was it? It was Jesus Christ himself. Saul, why are you doing this? I'm going to take your life and I'm going to save it. And as Paul writes this letter to the church in Rome, reflecting on how Jesus entered into his life and saved him from the wretch of a person that he was, he's mindful about the power of Christ in his life and in ours. Because he realized that our lives are not about, oh, I didn't murder anybody today. Didn't steal anything over from Albertsons today. He realized that his true life was found in what God had already done for him. Saul couldn't live up to the holiness of God, so what does God do? God comes to be one of us. And friends, this is the best story that you will ever hear in your entire life. Because you know that we can't save ourselves. You can't save yourself. You need a Savior. You see, if God thought we 
needed better businessmen to lead our country, he would have sent us all to Stanford Business School, right? But God didn't do that. God thought that we needed better musicians to speak the languages of the gods. He would have sent us all to the Juilliard School of Music, but God didn't do that. Looking with incredible compassion on the wretchedness of our lives, God sent us a Savior. And how did God save us? By teaching us the ways of the kingdom. By giving us the preeminent symbol of how we are to understand the world. And he stretched out his arms upon a cross. And those soldiers in pain and agony drove the nails to your Savior. And Jesus bore the sins of this world for you. Jesus took all of your selfishness. Jesus bore all of your sickness. Jesus took upon himself all the depravity of this world. And in a dying breath, died. And on this cross is the symbol for what God does with the wretchedness of this world. God takes it upon himself and dies. Now let me tell you what is alluded to in scripture, what happens next. Where was Jesus for the next three days, right? Well, there are little clues in Scripture in 1 Peter and Colossians that Jesus went to the place of the dead, Sheol, to proclaim the good news to all those who were held in captive. This gives us the tradition that is celebrated in many Orthodox churches today, that on that holy Saturday that we celebrate between Good Friday and Easter, that holy Saturday, where is Jesus? There's this beautiful image that God is in the depths of hell duking it out with Satan. And who's victorious? Jesus. And on that third day, Jesus raises again to tell us, to show us that all the wretchedness of this world and this life is overcome in the love and the power of this cross. Of Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Friends, Paul realized that the only thing that could save him was God himself. So we continue on with the scripture. Paul writes in verse 24, Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? And the very next verse is, Thanks be to God (laughs) through Christ Jesus our Lord. He continues on. So then with my mind, I am a slave to the law of God, but with my flesh, I am a slave to the law of sin. An emphasis is mine here. But Paul writes, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin And death, for what God has done with the law, those Ten Commandments, weakened by the flesh, could not do. God made you holy by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. And to deal with sin, he condemned sin in the flesh, so that the just requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Boy, you sound like Presbyterians today. I just gave you the best news of the universe. Thanks be to God. (laughs) Friends, what are you doing with your life? And what does it mean to be holy, to to be set apart for God? You have been given a gift that is beyond our comprehension. A gift that had the capacity to take a Pharisee rule follower who could check off all those lists of Saul who was renamed Paul. You've been given the same gift to realize that your life is not about rule following, (laughs) but to set your life in Christ who has already done it for you. So what are you doing with your life? 
I see some of my more mature friends in this room. God has given you a task. I see some of my younger friends in this room, hopefully with a whole lifetime ahead of you. What are you doing with your life? And the scripture says, be holy, set your life apart because it is there that you will find your life and your fulfillment and your joy. It is Jesus who makes you holy. So if you want to find your life, find Jesus and surrender it all. Some of you may know the German theologian Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He wrote a few books in the 20th century. He was a reformed pastor in Germany at the height of the Second World War, and he saw the political happenings happening around him and felt in his heart that he could not let the face of evil come to political power without doing something about it. So the premier of the Third Reich, Adolf Hitler, and his cronies wouldn't put up with folks who said that Jesus is my Lord, not the state. And Bonhoeffer was jailed. He wrote a few books. Put into an internment camp. And it is attributed to Bonhoeffer, who writes about the precious few years that he's been given and that you've been given. Bonhoeffer writes that being a Christian is less a, about cautiously avoiding sin and it is more about courageously and actively doing the will of God. Courageously and actively doing God's will. And Bonhoeffer is not just writing some highfalutin theology. He's looking at the life of Jesus, and he's looking at the law, and he's looking at a Savior, and he's realizing that his Savior, your Savior, did not go about like Sister Bertha better than you. Instead, Jesus himself was down with the prostitutes, sharing the love of God. He was with those terrible tax collectors, sharing the mercy of God's will. Jesus was with those who the world didn't care about whatsoever. And who were the ones that Jesus was rebuking? Those Pharisee rule followers. Because Jesus teaches us that to find your life is not about following rules. It's about finding your love and the will of God. In fact, Jesus, as we think about the Ten Commandments, says some things about other commandments. The first is this. In John's Gospel, Jesus says, A new commandment I give to you. Does anyone remember what that commandment is? Rhea, you've already talked. You can't answer. What is the new commandment? That Jesus, Jesus says, I give you a new commandment. What is it? Love one another. And then in Matthew's gospel, there was one of those Pharisee lawyers. Well, what does it mean to love your neighbor there, Jesus? And Jesus, what is the greatest commandment, Jesus? And he's quoting the Old Testament. Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two, says Jesus, hangs all of the law and the prophets. Now you know why we talk about love so much here at Covenant. Love. Friends, if you really want to find your life in the few precious years you've been given, I encourage you to find out this holiness in love. Give your life to Jesus, my friend. Your life will change, but your life will be saved. Encourage you to live courageously and boldly like Bonhoeffer inspires us to do. And I encourage you, whether you are a student at school or whether you're living out your retirement days in the comfort of your home, seek the kingdom of God in everything that you do. And all of these things will be added unto you. I close with this short vignette about what it means to lead a holy life. I witnessed holiness on Thursday afternoon. We're doing the funeral service for Lisa's father. And afterwards, there's a six-year-old young woman who goes to this church. Some of you know her. And we had just finished the service for her great-grandfather. 
And I'm standing by the casket. And the first thing I see this six-year-old girl do is to run up to her great-grandmother and say, I love you, wrapping her in arms of love. I almost start crying at this point, right? People begin milling around, and young six-year-old girl comes up to the casket. And I know this young lady, and I say, have you ever been to a funeral service before? No, I haven't. Can I touch this blanket? It's just the green velvetish stuff at the bottom of the casket. Like, Absolutely. Would you like to touch the casket? Young lady, how are you feeling today? I feel really good, Pastor. Why is that? Because I know that my great-grandpa is in heaven, and he's with Jesus. I started crying there with my wonderful friend who teaches me about holiness, about love. Friends, what are you doing with your life? What does it mean to be holy? The Lord asks this of you so that you may experience the richness of the life of a six-year-old child, knowing the promises that heaven awaits all of us if we would only seek first the kingdom of God. Amen and amen. Friends, we come to the time of our offering. The Lord gave his life for you. You're just going to give a couple bucks and friends, the Lord's really not that interested in your dollars. The Lord is more interested in your heart. What shall you render unto the Lord for this gift of amazing grace? Friends, there is an offering box in the back. You can place an offering there on your way out after the service. There are prayer cards in your pew. Take a moment to fill out a prayer request. Put that in the box. If you're worshiping online with us today, you can give on the website. But... Um, I beg of you, my friends, will you seek first this kingdom of God and the holiness? Your life will be changed forevermore. Amen. shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Alleluia, alleluia.
Friends, you may be seated. As we come to our prayer time today, we pray for Stacy that God would give him comfort. I hear that kidney stones are the male equivalent to childbirth, and thankfully I've experienced neither of those. So Stacy, we're praying for you, my friend. We have some things to celebrate today. Uh, Dr. Dick Green, whom we've been praying for for over a year, with us in the back, shared news this week that his cancer treatments have been effective, that tumors are shrinking, and that he gets a few weeks off chemo. So, Dick, we love you. We continue to pray for you. In a similar vein, Jacqueline Rush uh, heard word from her that her treatment is working. They're going to give her a few weeks off of chemo and reports good work uh, with God's intervention in her own life. So we celebrate with Jacqueline as well. We celebrate with David and Belinda Rithman, who today celebrating 50 years of wedded bliss. David and Belinda, we celebrate with you. Where are you? Can you wave? David's up in the booth, Belinda's over there. They hosted a terrific uh, reception yesterday afternoon, and if you weren't able to make it, there is some anniversary cake after service today. There are people and places that we lift up in prayer. We continue to lift up Lisa and her family as they mourn the loss of her father. We pray for Shanna's father, Dick, as he continues to be placed in a medical facility in Salt Lake City and prayers that he can be moved closer to home in these days of his life. We pray for this stage of the pandemic that God would continue to give us grace and love, especially for those people who see the world differently than us. Amen? Amen. We pray for the people of Haiti today, suffering the effects of a devastating earthquake. We pray for our friends in Ethiopia as they continue in a different region than Maji, but in northern Ethiopia, continue to worry about the realities of a possible civil war. So we pray for our Christian friends in Ethiopia and all of God's people there. We pray for this situation in Afghanistan 
And I certainly don't know the answers to that. Um, but we pray. Who will save us from the wretches that we are? Paul declares, thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So let us pray. Lord, we celebrate with those who are celebrating today. We grieve with those who are grieving today. We provide care and compassion to those who are hurting and struggling today. Lord, we celebrate with Rithmans, with Dick, with Jacqueline. We pray for Stacy and Dick and Bonnie and Lisa and all of their families. We pray that as we look at the world around us and we hear fear, we hear death, we hear despair, that you would give us the wisdom and love of Jesus who saves us, who calls us to be holy, to be set apart, to be filled with the joy of the Spirit and the love of God the Father and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, give us these fruits of the Spirit for this world and our hearts are in so desperate need. So be with us. Be with covenant as we seek to be a lighthouse into our community. We pray that you would use us to share God's love. Bless this event on Saturday evening that people would come together in the outdoors and enjoy in this crazy year. Lord, we pray for our nation that we would live as your people. We pray for President Biden. Governor Little, and all of our state and national and local delegates, that you would give them the spirit of discernment, righteousness, and justice. Lord, remind us of the greatest commandment, to love you, to love our neighbors. Lord, let our lives be filled with love. We pray in the name of the author of love, the prayer that Jesus taught us, praying our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to stand with me as we sing our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision.
with your life. May you know the joy of seeking the kingdom of God. Keep Christ as your vision and go forth to share the good news and know the blessings of God's love in your life. And may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you're praying.